here to introduce uh, Mr. Jamie's Marisotis, Jamie Marisotis, um, who's going to uh, speak, talk with us this evening. Um, Jamie Marisotis is a globally recognized leader in philanthropy, education, and public policy. Since 2008, he served as president and CEO of the Lumina Foundation. I bet a few of you have heard of that foundation. An independent private foundation that's committed to making opportunities for learning beyond high school available to all. He previously served as co-founder and president of the nonpartisan uh, Washington, D.C. based Institute for Higher Education Policy and is executive director of the Bipartisan National Commission on a College Affordability appointed by the U.S. President and Congressional Leaders. Marisotis is the author of a widely acclaimed book, America Needs Talent. It's great, you should read it. And is named a top 10 business book, it was named a top 10 business book of 2016 by Booklist. Jamie's frequently sought after as a media commentator and contributor. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, <clears throat> National Journal, Stanford Social Innovation Review, Washington Monthly, Political Roll Call, and other publications. He runs the gamut. His work includes extensive global experience as an advisor and consultant in Southern uh, Africa, the former Soviet Union, Europe, and other parts of the world. A respected analyst and innovator, Mayor Sotis, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. <clears throat> He's the recipient of numerous awards and holds honorary degrees from several universities and colleges and commits his time and energies as a trustee for a diverse array of organizations around the world. He serves as chair of the Council on Foundations in Washington, D.C., the past chair of the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, which I will add, was left out of 36 hours in Indianapolis, if you read that. It's the world's largest museum for children. Okay? Correct. He also serves on the boards of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership and the UK-based European Access Network. Uh, Jamie lives with his wife, Colleen O'Brien, a Chicagoan, uh, and their children, Benjamin and Elizabeth, in Indianapolis. This evening, um, we are actually going to have a sort of a fireside, chatty style uh, um, presentation. That's what um, Jamie requested. Could use and a fire in his room. That's a real <laughs> fire, so I want you all to know about that. Um, with that, um, let's, I'd, I'd like to welcome Jamie, give, uh, who lives here in Indianapolis, and then let's get started. So, Jamie. Half the battle is getting the technology right, Susan. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How many days have you been home? Uh, this month? Mm -hmm. Not many. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to start with a fundamental question. Um, Pew and Gallup regularly survey Americans' attitudes about college. Last summer, for the first time, Many Americans surveyed uh, questioned the value of higher education. For example, 58% of respondents said college has had a negative effect on the country. That's pretty shocking, especially to all of us here. How would you respond to those who question the value proposition of higher education, which is a theme of our uh, days together here in Indianapolis, and how higher education leaders and policymakers in the audience here tonight could have productive and com uh, constructive conversations about this? So, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Thank you all very much for coming to Indianapolis. A little chillier than normal for this time of year, but you're, you're all experiencing that. You know, I think part of what we've got to do is take a step back and think about uh, why we are where we are with higher education. And, and I, I think that uh, if you go back to the 20th century, you think about the ways in which higher education created the social and economic mobility, that drove most of what we would call the American century. Um, higher education rightly received credit for the fact that it was an engine of that social and economic progress, right? That the more talent that we could produce in our colleges and universities, the more we were likely to build and grow our industry, the more we were likely to create more stable and, and productive uh, communities, et cetera. Um, in the 21st century, a lot of that compact um, has eroded. It's eroded for a variety of reasons, but um, I would say the two biggest reasons are that inequality is rising, and uh, you know these these issues of of, of um, economic and social justice are challenging people at all levels. 
The biggest reason for that, in my view, is that the changing nature of work has driven us to this point where we need a lot more people with higher levels of talent in order to be able to be productive members of society and actually contribute to our, to our national, state, local well-being. Um, but the system that we have today is too expensive. Um, it doesn't produce outcomes at the rate that um, employers or the general public believe are sufficient. And um, it has challenges when it comes to serving the most vulnerable populations that we have and in order to be able to make them uh, successful in work and in life. So this compact has gradually eroded for all of the good that higher education clearly has done for American society in the 20th century, for all that we needed to do in the 21st century. The challenge is that this model of higher education has really, um, um, has really a change and is, and is in need of, of serious repair. Uh, to be clear here, the, the problem uh, with the data that's being cited is that um, it is a recipe for disaster for American society. If we literally fail to build the skill levels through high quality post-secondary learning in this country, we're going to impact jobs and wages, we're going to impact our, our uh, democratic stability, um, we're going to erode the American quality of life. Um, most of you have seen this data, but I'll repeat it because it's worth repeating that the greatest natural experiment that we had with the importance of skills was what happened after the last recession, mm. right? So what we saw in the last recession was first during the recession, when we lost eight to 10 million jobs in the American economy, the only category of people who saw job growth was people with college degrees, literally. Um, so for that population, they were the only ones that would work. The total number of people with college, who were working with college degrees actually increased during the recession. Post-recession, your ability to be a part of the middle class has been overwhelmingly driven by whether or not you have a high quality post-secondary credential. A degree is great, but so is a high quality certificate, certification, or other post-secondary credential, which I don't think we talk enough about in the traditional higher ed context, but all post-secondary credentials leading to pathways that will bring you up the ladder of opportunity, I think, are, are, are really important. And we've run into this, uh, this uh, challenge now that I think that post-recession, virtually all of the new jobs being created require a post-secondary credential. Jamie, could you talk about when you say a post-secondary uh, post credential, credential, what do you mean by that? So, look, um, what we know from, from the data is that certificates, certifications that are produced um, either with or connected to industry and uh, to, to business, um, as well as associate degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees, et cetera, um, all of those high quality credentials in, in all of those categories um, need, to be, need to be counted when we're talking about increasing attainment. And you know, my view is that um, we've, we've faced this, this dilemma of we've got to increase dramatically the number of Americans with high quality post-secondary credentials. We know what the data say about jobs and, and wages. It's, you know, the second point I was just going to get to here is that what happened with jobs is that all of the new job growth has been for people with college degrees uh, or people with at least a high quality post-secondary credential that's short of a degree. And wages have only increased for people with those, with those credentials. In other words, wages are actually declining for people who have anything short of a post-secondary credential. People who have gone to college but never graduated, people who only have a high school credential, people who are high school dropouts. All of those have seen real declines in wages. Only the group with post-secondary credentials has seen increases in wages. So, uh, long answer to your short question, but it, it seems very important to me that we get clearer on the fact that we must increase high quality post-secondary attainment to drive success if we want this century to be a new American century the way the last century was, driven by the prosperity that was motivated through, through higher education. So part of it might even be the question. You know, the question is asking, you know, what do you think about college? But we need to do a better job of defining what we mean by yeah, you know, these, these definitional questions are hard because uh, for many people, college actually means something very specific. It means 
a residential four-year uh, learning experience on a traditional college campus. Well, we know that that experience, right, people who graduate from high school, enroll in college within a year of graduating from high school, and go to a residential institution, represents only about one in five American college students today. So um, it is a significant minority of what is in American higher education today. Uh, the vast majority of people are in community colleges or they're commuters or uh, they, are, uh, they are adults. 40% uh, of the students in American higher education today are over the age of 25. So, so uh, our mindset about what American higher education is is dramatically different than what we knew of it in the 20th century when, when we went to college. Uh, let's talk attainment. Um, that's something that you're laser focused on at um, Lumina. So in uh, 2008, Lumina set out uh, the goal that by 2025, 60% of working age Americans would have a quality post-secondary degree or credential. How has that goal changed, if at all, over the years? What's been surprising to you? So it's interesting. So the goal, 60% of Americans having a high quality post-secondary degree certificate or other credential by 2025 has not changed. Since, since we said it. So I came to Lumina Foundation in 2008. We were talking about the goal by the end of 2008, um, and that's all we've talked about since, since 2008. Um, so um, it's been a, a sort of long-term part of, of our strategy. Um, what's changed is our understanding about how you get there, um, and in particular, our understanding that um, the, the key unit of analysis, so if you think about the attainment measure, it's a population measure, right? So the denominator is adults between the ages of 25 and 64. The numerator is people who have a high quality post-secondary degree certificate or other credential. So if you think about it as a population measure, if we want to change the system to increase the proportion of Americans with high quality credentials, we've got to make students, learners, the center of the system. Not the institutions, not even the employers or the policymakers, God bless you all, it is the students, uh, or as I increasingly like to say, the learner workers, because it is people who are gonna be coming into and out of the learning system over the course of an entire working lifetime. So thinking about that has really been an important part of how we have changed our focus and interest. It is not about changing the system of higher education, meaning the college and universities that's important, it's changing the entire ecosystem of post-secondary learning to make students the center of that system. Um, and that's led to several sort of ahas. One is as we've gotten deeper into the data, we've come to recognize that of the many problems that we have in that system, uh, we fundamentally don't serve today's students, the students that I mentioned just, just, just a minute ago. So we've got to do a much better job of focusing on racial equity as a key element of the system. We have large gaps in racial equity in, in American higher education and in the entire post-secondary learning ecosystem. We've got to come to grips with that. We've got to narrow those gaps because our fastest growing populations have the lowest amount of post-secondary attainment. It is in our collective self-interest to increase post-secondary attainment for African Americans, for Latinx populations, for American Indian populations, and even for the, uh, what people call the model minority group, which is you know, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, because there are so many subcategories within, within that group uh, that have very low attainment rates. So, so, so driving at that is one, one key issue. Another is driving at these questions of who the learners are or need to be, which is overwhelmingly adults. Uh, we've got this long-term sort of pipeline issue of making sure that we get people into the system as early as possible and make them, you know, what, I, I actually don't like the term, but educators love the term lifelong learners. Uh, I don't like the term because it sounds like a sentence from, from when you have a learner, right? Uh, uh, it sounds like a dream from the college president's perspective. Yes, customers for their lifetime, but but from the, from the learner's perspective, it sounds like the, the thing never ends, right? So. Um, but but for, for adults, for people of color, and for our lowest income populations, this system must serve them. Uh, that is the biggest thing that I think we have learned uh, in our work over the last few years, is that when you're trying to change the system, the system's gotta be designed around 
putting them at the center, not not any other player in that system. So that so, so with respect to the gap, um, there's sort of a, there's a moral imperative and an economic imperative. Yeah. Um, are we on track, or do you think that we're on track? And can you share a little bit about um, the data uh, that's showing up with respect to the goal? So when we started in uh, 2008, the sort of baseline year nationally, so we have data through, we have a website, some of you have seen called The Stronger Nation, where we can disaggregate the data by state, uh, by the largest metropolitan areas, and by a variety of other factors, including by, by, by race. Um, when we started in 2008, the national attainment rate, which at the time was only degrees, was 37.9%. Um, since then, we've been able to accurately count at a national level the proportion of Americans with uh, certificates, which adds roughly another uh, five percentage points to the total. Um, but we've, since 2008, added another five percentage points on top of that. So today, we are at, um, and this, these data are not even out yet, so I'm telling you something that hasn't gone um, fully public yet, but we're at 48.4% attainment rate uh, nationally. Our goal is 60%. So the question that I was asked uh, in this um, interview I did a few weeks ago with Forbes Magazine was, are we on track to get to the goal? My answer was, no, we are not on track to get to the goal. We will fall short. However, we will not fall as short as we thought not too long ago because the attainment rate is actually increasing. So if you're to project this out to by 2025, we're gonna be within striking distance in my view. So we'll be somewhere between 55 and 57% by 2025 based on our projection of, of the data. So what that means is we've gotta figure out how we can actually help get the country to that 60% goal. We wanna to try to catalyze that at Luna Foundation by trying to figure out where we can actually increase attainment in ways that are gonna benefit those communities uh, improve the quality of life in those states and therefore improve our collective well-being as, as a nation. That's part of our sort of forward, forward-looking strategy. But uh, we are, uh, we have made progress and we should celebrate that progress. Um, several of the states in this room are emblematic of increasing attainment. We should be proud of, of what's happening uh, in those states. But we should not be satisfied with where we are. We need to do more and we need to get better in part because of what I said in the earlier question, which is that the changing nature of work is making it highly unlikely that you will be a part of the middle class and be a productive member of American society unless you get a high quality post-secondary credential. Uh, that's just the reality that we face. So you uh, recently returned from a sabbatical. You might want to share a little bit about that experience with the folks here. I know um, there are uh, folks here who are interested in hearing what you learned and what you've been thinking about since you returned home. Yeah, by the way, I, I, um, there is no such thing as a sabbatical in philanthropy, <laughs> so I made it up. Um, and I, um, I, I had been at Luna 10 years, and I thought 10 years would be a good run, but the board asked me to stay longer, and um, they said, what do you want? Uh, we can't give you more money, so what's door number two? Um, and I said, I don't know. And I went and asked my wife. My wife said, you want a sabbatical? Um, so so uh, she was right. I did want a sabbatical. I took, um, I took six months off um, as the CEO of the Women Foundation in the first half of this year. Took my family to London, and I totally disconnected from, from the work. Um, actually, that's not true. I started writing another book. Uh, which I had just finished last week, uh, but um, but it was a really good experience for lots of reasons, personally, but professionally it gave me a chance to take a step back and really look at our work at Luminous Foundation from the outside to better understand sort of what we were accomplishing and what kind of catalyzing organization we are or could be, but also to pick my head up and look around the world and see what was going on. Um, I was mentioning to some people earlier tonight that, so this is my third CEO job. I've been a CEO 28 years of my life. And in all of my work, my focus has been on increasing high quality post-secondary attainment. Uh, that is essentially what I've done my entire, my entire career. Um, and one of the things when you take a step back and you look at the world is you, you make some, some uh, observations that you wouldn't other, otherwise been able to make. One of the biggest being that our enterprise, post high school learning, higher education, 
is really an industry that's driving knowledge growth and knowledge application uh, globally. But the pace of knowledge growth and knowledge application is growing at such an exponential level, our ability to stay on top of it is seemingly impossible at this point. So uh, I won't bore you with some of the details here, but there's this long-standing theory called the knowledge doubling curve. Um, and um, um, it's, it seems to me that if you understand this idea of, of the rate of the pace at, at which knowledge doubles, the pace at which it is doubling is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so, you know, in uh, a century ago, knowledge doubling at a societal level increased at about a, a pace of every 100 years. By the middle of the last century, it was increasing every 50 years. By the beginning of this century, it was, it was doubling every year. Today, we think that knowledge may be doubling every day in global society. So the question is, we are an enterprise of trying to generate knowledge that can be learned by humans in ways that they can actually apply and work in life. And I think we need to take a serious look at what role this enterprise of post-secondary learning plays in that long-term game of preparing humans for the future. Uh, this is the focus of my new book. It's called Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines. And um, it's predicated on this idea that going forward, we have to think seriously about how we are going to prepare humans for the work that only humans can do as machines increasingly do perform tasks that, that um, humans don't need to do or don't want to do. Um, and so it was a big lesson learned about both our work at Lumina Foundation, where we've been driving towards this attainment goal, and we're going to keep driving until December 31st of 2025, uh, to be clear, but also sort of about the long-term trajectory here of what is this business that we're in of uh, post-high school learning, and what is it about, and what is our sort of reason for being? I think it's preparing people for human work, the, the work that only, only humans can do. And I think we need to think seriously about how this enterprise can increasingly be steered towards, towards that objective. Um, I have other questions, but I, I'm going to jump to the last one, and then um, I think uh, we'd like to open up um, the yeah. better part of the time here for questions from uh, all of you. So we have 12 Midwestern states here. We're the Midwest Census region, all 12 states. Um, a mix of policymakers and higher education leaders, so it's an unusual mix. And the region as a whole is facing population shifts and changing demographics, presenting both a challenge and an opportunity. What advice do you have for these leaders and stakeholders about how to strategically position for the future here in our region? Yeah, I would say uh, a handful of things. Just a little uh, Yeah, um, I, I could see all my previous answers. And in addition, <laughs> um, you know, think about a handful of things as you go about making the decisions that you need to, to, to make. Um, one would be, are the policies, practices, and ideas that you're trying to implement actually putting the students, the learners first. Are they the center of the system, of this, of this ecosystem? Are their interests the primary focus of your work? If they're not, why not? Why aren't they the center of, of, of the system? We get very, it's very easy to get caught up in these sort of, of broader conversations about allocation of resources and dividing the pie equally and finding ways to uh, 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 distribute in ways that respect history, that respect uh, geography, lots of things. Uh, but all of those things are important. I don't mean to suggest they're not, but the most important things is what do the learners in your states, in your communities need, and how does this enterprise of higher education and post-secondary learning actually deliver on that? Um, second thing I would say is um, this enterprise has literally got to do more and it's got to do better. By more, I mean that we need to increase post-secondary attainment, and by better, I mean that we've got to better serve those populations that I was talking about, and we've got to make sure that the credentials that we issue represent real and relevant learning uh, that will allow them to be successful in, in work and in life. Um, and that means that we need to focus clearly on what the outcomes are that we are trying to uh, achieve uh, through this system. 
You may be able to achieve those outcomes through outcomes-based funding models. You may be able to achieve those outcomes through productivity measures on college and university campuses. You may be able to achieve those outcomes uh, simply through uh, a, a different allocation of resources than, than what you've done before. But the point is that we've literally got to do more and better, and we've got to do that in a context where there's unlikely to be significant new resources in, in order to be able to deliver on that potential. I mean, I understand the fiscal situation in most of the states. There's few uh, free dollars available for, uh, for these purposes. Um, I believe higher education deserves more investment, but I think we've got to demonstrate the need for that investment and deliver on the outcomes that, uh, that, that we should be delivering on. Um, and then, you know, I think maybe the, the last thing that um, uh, I would urge you to, uh, to, to think about is to make sure that you're always taking the time to collaborate and learn from each other. I think this is really important um, in a world where um, leaders come and go, ideas uh, get generated and get destroyed. Um, over time, what we want to do is build the best possible solutions that are going to help the most number of people and have the greatest impact in your states and, and in your communities. Um, the only way you do that is you learn from each other. Um, you learn from your mistakes and you learn from, from your successes. Um, there are no magic bullets. Um, it's, I wish I could say, if you just did this one thing, you know, the, the, the favorite uh, thing on the internet now is this one trick will solve everything, right? And you see that on the internet all the time. There is no one trick here. Uh, there's no such thing. It doesn't exist in higher education. There's lots of things that we need to do. You need to set goals. You need to focus on outcomes. You need to make sure that you're serving the right, the right students. But within that, there's lots and lots of different mechanisms that are going to apply to the unique context and circumstances of your states, of your institutions, of the outcomes that you're trying to achieve as a state. And the best way to go about doing that is to learn from each other and spend time in these kind of settings, as well as in lots of other forums where you're actually learning in real time from what's happening from the, from the strategies being tried elsewhere. Great. Thank you. Um, let's give Jamie a round of applause. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience, from all of you. And um, I think we got about what, 15 minutes, Katie? What do we have? 15? Right. Test. All right. Well, wonderful topic, and I already Googled to try to find your book. Uh, I'm Mark Hager, I'm the Chancellor of North Dakota, with I think all the North Dakota. Commissioners are here today, so we probably should get an award for that, probably, right? <laughs> um, so we're working on this in North Dakota pretty hard. Um, we may have the first uh, student bill of rights for privacy and the AI, machine age, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the problem we're running into um, is our talent is being poached. Um, we've had six of our computer scientists, digital scientists, hired in the last six months by you know, the Carnegie's, the NYU's, the Rensselaer's. Um, and so I'm you know, really struggling with this task we have before us to start to build digital knowledge and digital analytics, et cetera, and yet we're in this market where talent just flows, right. um, which as a historian wasn't that way. You know, we had many Yale, Harvard graduates come to North Dakota and build our universities, but they didn't just jump on a train and leave and go back east and they stayed. So any thought on on building this human talent when there's so much mobility among our professors um, in these high demand fields. Yeah, so you know, on, there, there's sort of two sides to the mobility equation, right? So there's, there's a great degree of mobility for people who have the means and very little mobility for people who don't, right? So we've got to create some sort of equalizing force where it's a combination of, of factors. The, the way to think about talent, I, I've said this in, in different forms for years, is that it's not zero sum. You've got to both develop the talent that you have, and you've got to recruit the talent that you need to make up for the gaps where you can't develop that talent. Um, that's as true today as it was uh, historically. It's why at a national level, I think immigration is a very important part of our conversation. We've got to grow talent, and we've got to add talent. It's just, a, it's just a, a fact of life. You can't do it through one strategy alone. You've got to think about, about both strategies. Um, uh, so that's, that's one, one thing, is that, is that uh, this should not be seen as a zero-sum game. My loss 
is your gain or, or the other way around. You gotta think about both talent development um, um, with the people who are already there and recruitment of the talent in the gaps uh, that you have. And the second thing I would say um, is that uh, this is a sort of a bigger question about uh, you know why is it that there are um, quality of life questions that emerge in certain parts of the country uh, compared to others, and um, you know some of this goes well beyond your uh, your purview in, in higher education, but I think these broader efforts to better understand what is it that makes um, Austin attractive but you know, some city that isn't like Austin, less attractive. Other than the weather. Uh, and yeah, other than, other than, the, uh, other than the weather. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of, of examples of places where weather's not terribly desirable. Seattle. Uh, just, Seattle's a very good example. Uh, but, um, but they still become um, uh, attractors of, of talent. Um, the other thing that, in, in my experience from the, from the places where, where I've tried to talk about these, these issues, is um, making sure that your employer and business community is highly engaged in these conversations about growing and attracting uh, the talent is really important, uh, particularly at the post high school level. Um, for much of the last couple of decades, a lot of that energy and investment has been in K-12 reform, right? So the charter school movement has been driven by the business community. Lots of the changes in K-12, you know, sort of an understanding of leveling the playing field, particularly for, for poor children, has been an important part of the, of the business community's interest. But the engagement of the employer community in these big questions about growing and attracting the talent um, are unfortunately uh, less common, that, or they tend to be very sort of, of, um, of narrowly targeted around a specific industry or a set of issues, as opposed to the global uh, global um, efforts to, to increase talent. The value proposition piece. Yeah. yeah. I'm questions? surrounded by the buffalo herd back here. <laughs> uh, I'm Randy Furling. Uh, Where are you my, my concern that I have, right? you talked about the compression, it only took 66 years for the Wright brothers to fly the length of, uh, right. of the 747 wing and to walk on the moon, and it took, uh, when the neutrons were discovered in 32, we made an atom bomb right. in, in 45. But I'm worried about the feedstock. In 1950, when I was in high school, that only 2% of uh, families were single, uh, single household uh, heads, and now it's uh, approaching. It's probably over fifty percent now, and, and, and very. So there's the challenge, and and that group of people seem to have immediate gratification, less discipline, uh, as part of their uh, uh, portfolio that they bring into the learning. Uh, institutions and how would you change this cultural divide that we're undergoing at a very rapid rate? Yeah, it, you know, it is an, it is an endemic problem in American society. I don't know that higher education can can solve this alone. Uh, I've had really good conversations actually with my friend Teresa Lovers, who's who's right here, the Minister of Higher Education here in Indiana, about um, how we've tended to try to want to segment this into into buckets um, of people and say, why does this group have and that group uh, doesn't have? And yet oftentimes there's common problems that, that are, are challenging communities. So uh, in, in our view, the problems that have plagued rural communities are the same problems that have plagued cities uh, for many years. There's more in common than what's going on in rural communities and cities and then there is different and yet we tend to treat them you know our politics are divided by urban versus rural our, our conversations are divided and in many ways they are they're very very common uh, issues so the issue of the family unit that you're talking about is a much more much more complex uh, set of issues that I think uh, uh, we're gonna be able to resolve here tonight um, I will say that uh, for most of the people that uh, we are trying to serve in, in the higher ed system, we have to give them opportunities over the course of their entire lifetime. We cannot give up on them if we didn't get them when we had the first bite at the apple before the age of 25 
we've got to re-engage them and get them into the system at a later point because we know what the payoff is. There's an interesting uh, statistic that we've been talking about at the Lumina Foundation in the last few years, which is that, so we've talked a lot about sort of better educating those, uh, I would call them these um, traditional age learners, right? Um, and getting them into the system and getting them high quality post-secondary credential by 25. We've talked about getting people who've gone to college and then dropped out back into the system and get them to complete. But we talk very little about the 64 million adults who've never had any post-secondary experience at all. And that group represents, I think, a group where we should be focusing a lot of our interest and attention on about how do we get them into this system because what we know about the changing nature of work is that many of those who had middle uh, wage, you know, middle income jobs, lost them in the Great Recession and they didn't come back, and those that have them now, they're slowly being squeezed by automation and AI in ways in which their jobs are going to, to, to be eliminated in, in the coming years, um, if not sooner. So, um, so I think that's what we've got to focus on, is focus on widening the aperture in terms of who the system needs to serve and how we get them into, into the door and across the threshold. Um, I don't know if we've got the capacity to solve the, <laughs> the macro uh, 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 social context that, that you're, you're talking about. But it's also about exposing folks, whether you were able to grow up with an example in your family or you were able to have some sort of exposure as a high school student to the opportunities, right? right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the first in my family to go to college. I come from an, uh, an immigrant uh, family. Um, my parents didn't know what college was, uh, except for one thing, that I was going. Uh, you know, that, that's what I got from the kinds of parents that you're, that, that, that you're referencing, right? Which was this ethic, this belief in, in the system. And so applying our energies on that and helping people to understand the value of this system and why it's so important to their to their future, I think, is, is really important. But I don't think that's where most of the problems lie. If you look at the public polling, most Americans, irrespective of income, race, geography, lots of factors, get why increasing their talent matters, but they don't, many of them don't believe that that system is for them, that it's not affordable for them, that the structure doesn't work for them, um, and that people like me don't really succeed in that environment. That's part of our collective challenge in higher education. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, are there a couple more questions that you have? Senator? I'll just, I'll just shout it out. Reynold Nesiba from, Reynold Nesiba from, uh, from South Dakota. Where is the federal government in, uh, in all of this, in terms of what role they play? They used to be more generous in terms of Pell Grants, in terms of uh, financial aid. Even back in the George W. Bush administration, uh, doing things like having public service loan forgiveness. Uh, and now we have an administration that's completely opposite and actually trying to eliminate those programs. I mean, what role does the federal government play in helping us uh, achieve the goal that Lumen has set out for us? Yeah, so the, the, um, the, I spent two decades of my life in Washington before I came to Indiana. Uh, it's why I have this hairline. Um, <laughs> Um, and I worked in a, in a bipartisan, nonpartisan context for, for all of that time. Um, I still believe in the power of compromise uh, and in, in the value of um, education being an equalizer that should not have to do with, with party or, or ideology. The problem at the federal level, I think, um, is that that model has largely outlived its usefulness for the kinds of students who need to be served today. By that, I mean that that model was predicated on a traditional age learner, um, as someone who um, was going to be able to come through the system and get the credential by the age of 25, and, uh, and be able to then use that to be successful over the course of an entire work lifetime. Um, we know that now, um, most of what you learn needs to be continuously upgraded, so we need the system to serve you over the course of that, of that entire um, um, work lifetime span. But we also need to make sure that the system's more, more targeted on serving the adults, the people who have never been before, 
or those people who got knocked out of the system who started and never, never completed their, their credentials. Um, the federal system has largely been focused on students, right? So the vast majority of the money at the federal level is through need-based financial aid, but it is inexorably moved towards self-pay, which is short-term, you know, shorthand for debt. Um, so we've moved more and more of the financing towards towards debt, and you know, with debt uh, now exceeding outstanding debt more than a trillion dollars, we obviously have a a, a large-scale problem on our hands. Um, I think that I'm a Pell Grant recipient. I, I, I call myself a walking advertisement for every financial aid program you've heard of. I got a state scholarship, a Pell Grant, a scholarship for my local community, my church, you name it, um, uh, I, I participated in it. And I think that's the strategy we should be thinking about here, is how we can knit together a different social compact where we better define what the federal role is, where we can articulate what the federal state relationship is in ways that are better than they were before, than, than they are now or even were before. And then we find ways to make sure that the private sector is actually fully engaged in that compact in ways where we haven't uh, formally acknowledged uh, their role before. Um, I'm unimpressed with most of the big national solutions that have been proposed so far, so um, I don't think that free college is a magic bullet. Um, I don't think that ISA is the, uh, um, uh, is the savings of, um, uh, efforts uh, are, are also going to solve uh, the problem. But I think we should be talking about all those things in service of a different social compact where we can actually knit together a new system that better serves today's students, uh, not those students that the old system was designed to serve. One last question. Ter Teresa has one, so I'm Teresa. afraid of Teresa's question. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, you're very careful when you talk about 60% that you use the word quality before it. Yes. I think as states and as we have new providers and new students in the system, having any sort of quality assurance is becoming increasingly complicated for us. Some would go to a singular measure of how much money you make with a certain degree, and certainly that is important in terms of how much debt you take on and all the other issues, but any thoughts that you would share with us about how you measure quality? Yeah, um, a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the issue, I, I want to say a couple things about quality. Um, uh, so there was a, a, a Luna task force that was convened, issued a report a few months ago called Unlocking the Nation's Potential, which was about these issues of, of quality and quality assurance. And one of the observations at this very diverse task force of people from the workforce side, from higher education, from public policy, all came together and said is that these conversations about equity and quality need to be part of the same equation. Um, historically, we've tended to view these as sort of countervailing forces, that the more equity that you have, the less quality you have, or the more quality you have, the less equity you have. And I think part of what we've got to acknowledge is that equity and quality have to go together. Um, it makes no sense for you to have an increasingly equitable system if the quality of the credentials is poor, nor does it make sense to have very high quality if you're not serving the populations who aren't well served. So, uh, for starters, I think we need to bring these equity and quality conversations together. Federal policy has been the primary place that we've had a lot of these conversations by talking about the quality assurance mechanisms for eligibility for federal student financial aid. Um, I think we're touching the wrong end of the elephant if we think the federal government's gonna solve our problems here. Um, I think what we should be focusing on is um, a different conversation about how equity and quality can be driven by states with the federal government providing a sort of knitting together of what the states need to be doing. So I think that's a productive conversation that uh, the compact, among other en entities, should be talking about, is how do you actually bring those things together and then tell the federal government what you need, what's missing from, 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 the, from the equation. Um, I, I, it's also worth stating, just to go back to, to, the, to, to the prior question, we could be waiting for a long time for the federal government to do much of anything. Uh, and uh, we don't have time to wait, uh, to wait for them. So, um, you know, these um, higher ed act reauthorizations 
are, are becoming um, less and less frequent because of the gridlock in Washington, and yet the system continues to evolve, but that those mechanisms in the Higher Ed Act don't serve today's students or the system that, that exists today. So the other part of the quality conversation, Teresa, that I think is, is gonna be uh, really important is that we've gotta figure out how we actually knit together all of the different credentials that exist today into a cohesive pathway so that if you get a certificate or a certification, it actually translates into what you then would do at the next level in getting the next qualification, whether it's an associate degree or something else. Indiana's been at the forefront of this work through an enterprise called Credential Engine that some of you are, are familiar with that's trying to actually uh, sort of increase the transparency uh, behind all of the different uh, types of, of credentials that are, that are being issued. But the growth of credentials and the lack of an understanding of what's behind those credentials is really important. Credential Engine isn't a quality assurance mechanism, it's a transparency mechanism. But it will allow the people who can think about quality to better understand the connections among all of those different mechanisms over time that I think is going to be increasingly important. But this explosion of credentials that we've seen uh, in the last decade of badges and, and you know all kinds of new kinds of of certifications and credentials is extraordinary, and we need to be thinking about quality in that entire system, not just in the traditional model of what federal Title IV student aid eligibility has said, but really in that entire pathway of learning. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing your evening with us. I know you've got kids at home and your board's in town this week, yes. so we really are very, very grateful to you for joining us tonight and spending your time with us. Thank you very much.